Mark Twain said there is no distinctly Native American criminal class except Congress. More than a century later, things really haven't gotten much better. Public approval of the House of Representatives is now at an all-time low. Best-selling author Robert Draper has an idea why his new book is Do Not Ask What Good We Do inside the U.S. House of Representatives. Good morning. Good morning. I did not get the pink tie memo. <laughs> well, there you go. That's okay. You need to flip your tie around, Robert. Ah, thank you very much. You, want, you look right. good on TV. Uh, thank you very much for doing yes. that, Fred. Yes. yes. Uh, so what, did, what do we see when we look inside the House of Representatives today? We know it's Republican control, majority. Sure. We know that a lot of attention has been paid to the Tea Party. We know that there have been some scandals. We see dysfunction more than anything else. I mean, the, the Republican-controlled House is basically the tip of the spear against the Obama administration. And it's a, it's a real paradox that uh, the most distinctly democratic institution in America is also the most loathed. I mean, as uh, John Dingell's quoted in the book as saying, I think pedophiles would do better in terms yeah, but, of public standing. But you have to say that there's this point. Many people say, I dislike very much Congress, but I like my congressman, a congresswoman. They do say that. And, and we'll see in November how they react uh, to uh, you know the debt ceiling fiasco. But uh, that's when public opinion started to plummet for this House. It, it, uh, I mean, they, they moved in these 87 freshmen on a tide of the, the Tea Party movement, presumably to shake things up. But instead, the government came to a virtual standstill. And you spent a little bit of time with the freshman class, the freshman I Republicans. Did. And they raised a little bit of a ruckus, considering that a lot of them really didn't have any kind of political experience. About a third of them did not. And, it's, and it is typically the case that freshmen are there to be seen and not heard. In <laughs> fact, in 1902, there was a club called the Tantalus Club of disgruntled Republican freshmen who basically celebrated their own powerlessness and were uh, an entertainment force on Capitol Hill. These guys may have been entertaining, but they also intended to get things done, too. And, and, for, for, and that's really, for some of them, that's why they came in, too, because they, part of their issue is people have been here too long. They've been sure. doing things the same way for far too long. But their influence for, for a rather small group of people within this large body has been pretty impressive, or at least was in the beginning, especially when it comes to House Speaker Boehner in some instances. No, that's right. I mean, they were the tail that wagged the dog. And I think Speaker Boehner recognized, he has a, Speaker Boehner has uh, an expression that when you say, uh, follow me, and you start walking, and you look over your shoulder, and no one's behind you, <laughs> you're not leading. You're just taking a walk. And <laughs> yeah. he came to learn that, that the, with this very, very strong-willed freshman class, that there was no point giving orders if people weren't going to obey them. What about when it comes to things like the budget? So, so Charlie spoke with Speaker Boehner last week, and he basically said, well, we kind of had an idea. We had a deal with the president. President, but then it was the president who mm. didn't follow through. But you allude to something else in your book that, in fact, it, it was Boehner who backed down due to pressure. Well, what had happened was that uh, the freshman class in particular, as well as some senior conservative members, kept pushing Speaker Boehner farther and farther to the right. And it was the speaker was warned by some of his allies within the Republican-controlled House that if he produced a deal with President Obama that would only get, say, 60 votes or something, that he stood the chance of a mutiny, much as what occurred uh, uh, when Speaker Gingrich was around. Boehner was around during that day, didn't want to repeat that. But Boehner said to me that he was prepared to risk his speakership. Uh, mm. Do you doubt? Uh, I do doubt that. I, I, mm. <laughs> I think that uh, he believes there's no honor in suicide and, and uh, the... Was it suicide or leadership? I well, mean, it's, uh, leaders well, take risk. That's true. That's true. But I think that, that uh, and I think that, that the speaker was doing, and I think he's temperamentally suited for this job because he recognizes that he's got a very, very conservative conference. They're the reason why he's speaker, after all, these 87 freshmen, and uh, and he can't willfully ignore, you know, the movement that blew uh, them into power. But at the same time, uh, he's trying to get deals done. Across the aisle is Nancy Pelosi. Mm -hmm. Tell me about her. Well, a, a, a very, very strong-willed individual, and I think much more in control of her caucus uh, than uh, than Speaker Boehner, Speaker Boehner was of, uh, of his. She, though, uh, very much wanted uh, to have an activist agenda, agenda in 2009, 2010. It was she who insisted on having, for example, after the stimulus bill, an energy bill that was cap and trade, very controversial, even among Democratic ranks. And didn't make it through the Senate. Didn't, no. And then, the, of course, the health care bill, which was... Uh, uh, a, a massive bill that to this day many uh, Democrats can't explain, much less defend. And you were taking a look at Anthony Weiner. I found this interesting. You were taking a look at him before his embarrassing kerfluffle. You were already looking at him. Why? Sure. Well, I, I thought I was interested in Anthony because he's he's a, a kind of perfect postmodern congressman, one who sort of recognizes the media celebrity aspect of being a congressman and it sort of gets the joke of that. He also was the guy uh, most often turned to by Speaker Pelosi 
as the parliamentary counter thruster, as it were, to the Republican controlled majority. So I knew he was going to be in the thick of things. I didn't know that uh, his life would erupt in scandal. Yeah. He's also reflective Nobody of did. the new congressman or woman in that he was a former staffer. That's right. That's right. A Chuck former Schumer. staffer for Chuck Schumer. One last question. Mm -hmm. uh, former President Bush, uh, who you wrote a book about, mm -hmm. uh, he seems to like being post president. Very much so. I think that, you know, it, it's, it's in fact true, Charlie, what he'd said all along, which is that he didn't crave the presidency. Uh, I, I think he enjoyed being president, but he likes his private life. He likes being on his ranch in Crawford, probably more than in Dallas. And, uh, and I suspect that uh, though he's going around giving speeches and all that, I, I, I think he's going to remain very much a private person. Before you go, because we tease, I hate when I'm watching a show and we tease it and we don't get the answer. You said there's something about Anthony Weiner that even people close to him didn't know. What is that? Very rough on his staff. I mean, oh. probably more so than just about anybody on Capitol Hill. And, and in a way that was not, it wasn't just that he was demanding, uh, he could be pretty nasty towards them. And it was an aspect uh, that, that was well known on the Hill, but uh, not beyond, apparently. Does he have a political future? Uh, doubtful, doubtful. Mm -hmm. But if it's him versus Alec Baldwin for the mayorship, we'll yeah. see. All right. <laughs> We will see. <laughs> to be continued.